Let's continue our discussion on pot odds and discuss how to play when you are facing a preflop all in and you have to figure out if you should call or fold. Recognize that your hand will win some amount of the time against all hands your opponent would potentially go all in with. And you don't know what they have because that's not how poker works. So let's suppose you are playing 10 big blinds deep and the hijack goes all in and then it folds around to you in the big blind. The hijack is the player who would be first to act if there were only five people at the table. And let's say you think the hijack goes all in with this range. Maybe they're tighter, maybe they're looser, depending on how they play. You need to figure that out and make that assessment for yourself. Well, first things first, what are our pot odds? In this scenario, how much more do we have to call? Well, we have to call nine more because we already have one big blind in the pot from our big blind. That money's no longer ours. We're not putting that in again. We already put it in. So we have to call nine to win our nine call plus the hijacks all in plus our big blind, which was already in the pot, plus the ante, if we're playing in a tournament, which will often be the case, and the small blind. You do this math, this means we need to win 41.8% of the time or more to justify calling in this situation. Well, the question becomes, which hands win more than 41.8% of the time? And you can use a hand range calculator to figure this out. I'll show you how. This is the range you're going to end up with, but I'll show you how to figure out what you should call with. We go back over here, take a look at the opponent's range, and you're going to put this into Equilab, which I've already done here. You select the hands your opponent would go all in with, and then you click Apply. Let's get that on the screen. It's slightly off the screen. Come on, computer. Click Apply. Then you go to Tools, Hand Range Calculator, and then let's say we want to win 42% of the time. Click calculate hand range, take the main window, and this now shows us roughly the hands we should be calling with. If you want to be even more precise, if you want to be even more precise, you would do 41.8%, right? Do 41.8. Calculate hand range, take the main window, here you go. This is roughly the range of hands you're going to want to call with in this situation. Recognizing, though, all the hands that are at the bottom of this chart are going to be neutral to break even. Okay? So the question becomes do you want to be calling off for all of your chips in a neutral to break even spot? And the answer is probably not, because all these hands right in here are going to be neutral. All the hands down here are going to be neutral. These are going to be neutral. And whenever you're playing in a situation, you want to be profiting. You don't want to be breaking even most of the time, especially in a tournament. So. If this is roughly our calling range when we need 41.8%, here's our calling range when we need 44%. And again, to figure that out, you go back to Equilab, you clear out this range here, do tools, hand range calculator, you make this number 44%, which is going to make sure we have a bit of an edge. Take that to the main window, and here you have it. This is roughly what we should be calling the all-in with if we want to have a bit of an edge. And so that means in this scenario, this exact specific scenario, Assuming we want to have a bit of an edge against this range we've assigned our opponent, we should be calling with these hands and everything else folds. So even though we don't know what our opponent has, because we've assigned them this range and because we know that we want to win 44-ish percent of the time, that's what we should call with. Now, I realize that's only one scenario and things can change a lot. For example, say we have eight big blinds instead of 10. Well, in that scenario, we should call off a little bit wider because we're risking proportionally less compared to this scenario where we're um, facing the 10 big blind all in, right? So we would call off wider in that instance. How much wider? Well, figure out your pot odds, go through there, do the same calculation, and that will give you the answer. Uh, maybe the hijack is way tighter than you think they would normally be. Maybe you know that they don't play very many hands, so maybe they're not going all in with these suited connected type hands or these small aces. In that scenario, you would need to call off tighter because their range would be stronger, okay? Okay. What if they're going all in much wider? Say they go all in with any two cards, any any single hand. They just go all in because they're crazy. Well, in that scenario, you should be calling off wider. Now, let's, let's actually just take a look at that and see how much wider we should be calling off if they're going to go all in with 100% of hands. And that's the only thing that changes. Okay? We can go to Tools, Hand Range, Calculator. Let, let's presume we still want to have that 44% equity instead of 41.8. Calculate the range. Take the main window. And here's what we would call with if we knew they were going all in with every single hand. A whole lot wider, right? It turns out when you only need to win 44% of the time and they have 100% of hands, 
you get to call off pretty wide. Now, would I ever actually call off this wide in game against anyone? The answer is no. Why? Because I don't know they have 100% of hands. It's hard to know your opponent's in there jamming with any two cards. But if your opponent is insane, maybe to, you know, bake in some, you know, maybe the fact that they just shoved a few hands in a row, maybe they're shoving 50%, right? I mean, that's certainly possible. If we want to have 44% against the 50% range, take this to the main window. I certainly have spots where I've called off this wide against people who I think are absolute lunatics. But most people aren't shoving 100%. Most people aren't even shoving 50%. They're shoving good, strong, reasonable ranges. And for that reason, you don't need to be making these humongous adjustments. But I wanted to show you this is how you would go about doing that. Because your opponents are not all going to be playing good, strong, perfect poker. When you are facing an all-in, you need to consider other things. For example, your opponent's range may not be linear. For example, maybe they don't go all in with these hands at the top of the range. Maybe they raise those small with the idea that they're going to then hopefully trick you into going all in. And maybe they're only shoving with this range. And as their range loses the top portion of the range to go all in, that makes the range weaker, right? You also have to account for the players yet to act. If you are on the button instead of the big blind, well, you have to account for the fact that the two players yet to act are going to wake up with a really good hand and always call about 5% of the time each. So that means that if we were in the exact same scenario on the button instead of the big blind, we need to call off tighter to account for that. You also want to presume that you may be a little off with your opponent's or with the, the assessment of your opponent's range. So maybe to account for that, if you think they're going all in with this range, maybe you actually narrow it just a little bit. Maybe you don't think they're shoving the 10-8 or the 9-8 or the king-9 suited, queen-9 suited, king-10 offsuit, ace-4 offsuit, ace-3 offsuit. Tighten it just a little bit to give yourself a little bit of wiggle room because if they aren't shoving the bottom portion of their range, and they're always shoving the top portion of their range, but you call off as if they're shoving the bottom portion of it as well, uh, that may result in you calling a little bit too wide. And if you consistently make calls that are a little bit too wide, that's not going to work out for you. And also, you want to account for the payout implications. When you're playing in a tournament, especially once you start to get somewhat shallow stacked, usually you're somewhere near getting in the money. And as you get closer and closer to getting in the money or near a final table, that's going to result in you wanting to play a little bit tighter in scenarios where a play may make chips, because even though it may make chips, it may lose money. Because whenever you lose a tournament and are out, you lose all future potential hands that you could potentially win money on. And your opponents ladder up and you don't. Whereas if you fold, sometimes they go broke and then you ladder up. So always account for the payout implications as well. And we'll be discussing that more throughout this math course. But yeah, that's how to play when you're facing a preflop all in. Are you a shark or a fish? Well, I'm very excited to introduce Peak GTO and the very first poker ELO score. You can battle against the bots and see how you fare while at the same time improving your skills and leveling up from a student to a shark. Get started with Peak GTO for free right now. Let's discuss another important concept that you always want to keep in mind when you are playing at the poker table, and that is the stack to pot ratio. The stack to pot ratio helps you understand which bet sizes and strategies you should be using in many different scenarios because as the stack to pot ratio gets deeper and deeper or shallower and shallower, that impacts which type of hands have more and more value. You can calculate the stack to pot ratio by dividing the effective stack, which is the shallowest stack among the players involved in the pot, by the total amount in the pot. You're always considering the effective stack, the shortest one involved, because that is the most that you can lose. So let's say the stacks remaining are $180 and the pot already has $90 in it. The stack to pot ratio would then be 180 divided by 90, which is a 2.0 stack to pot ratio. If this was $270 remaining in the stacks, it would be a 3.0 stack to pot ratio. If there were $90 in the stack and 90 in the pot, it'd be a 90 over 90, which is a one to one stack to pot ratio. Stack to pot ratios fuel and determine and drive decision making and strategy in all sorts of spots. If you have less than a one stack to pot ratio, meaning you have less than the size of the pot remaining in your stack, you wanna be thinking about moving all in. You are not risking all that much to win a lot in that scenario. But if the stack to pot ratio is four or greater, well, then an all in should not even really be considered. Stack to pot ratio is also gonna help you understand how much to bet on the turn so that you can potentially get all in by the river when you feel inclined. Take a look at this scenario right over here. Should we be going all in or not? Well, on this board with top pair, probably the best hand, the opponent checks and we have 
6,100 chips into a 7,800 pot. We have a less than one stack to pot ratio. So in this scenario, we are going to want to be going all in if we're going to bet. If instead we had 10 times as many chips, 61,000, well, we'd never go all in for eight times the size of the pot or whatever it is, because then we're risking a ton to win relatively little. And because we're risking so much, when the opponent calls, they're going to be calling with hands that probably beat eight, ace 10, even though they don't have that many of those hands that do beat the ace 10. So this is a spot where we are not going to want to be going all in whenever we have eight times the size of the pot. But for 0.8 times the size of the pot, we can easily go all in. So you see here, just having more or fewer chips in this scenario really, really, really impacts your strategy. Stack to pot ratio is going to inform you as to how much implied odds you are getting. Because when you call a bet, you may be able to win more money on the next betting round. So far, we've mostly been discussing when there is no more betting to happen. We were discussing facing a preflop all in and pot odds earlier. But quite often, there's more money to go in. So you can actually call even though you're not getting the correct immediate pot odds because you have implied odds on the later betting rounds. For example, say we're playing $500 deep at 2-5 no limit hold'em. The button raises to $15. We call from the big blind with 7-6 of spades. The flop comes 8 of clubs, 5 of diamonds, 2 of hearts. We check and they bet $30, roughly the size of the pot. Well, in this scenario, what are our pot odds? We have 30 divided by about 90, which is about 33%. We do the rule of four and two. Since we're only going to see the turn if we call the bet, we're going to multiply that by two because we're not guaranteed to see the river. If we knew the opponent would always check behind on the turn, you'd multiply our outs by four, but that's not how poker works. They're going to bet the turn sometimes. So we take our number of outs, which is eight. We have four nines and four fours times two, which means we're going to make the straight on the turn 16% of the time. A lot of people stop right there and say, well, 16% is way less than 33, so we should fold. But that is absolutely not true because if we do make the straight, we have the best hand and we could potentially win the opponent's remaining stack. Notice here, the stack to pot ratio is 15, super duper duper deep, right? So this is a spot where we're definitely not going to fold, even though we're only going to improve 16% of the time on the turn. It's important to recognize that the exact implied odds are sometimes very difficult to determine because you don't know how much more money is going to go in on the later betting rounds. Let's say we have king three of diamonds and the big blind and your opponent bets 1,000 on the turn where we have a gut shot straight draw, meaning we can get the four only to make the straight and a flush draw. Well, in this spot, our opponent's betting more than the size of the pot. Our, we have to put in a thousand to win a total of about 2,850, which means we need to realize 35% equity, but we only have 13 outs, which means we need to win 26%, or we're going to get there 26% of the time. 26 is less than 35, so this looks like we're not getting the correct pot odds to continue. However, you know that when you get there, let's presume your opponent's going to go all in roughly 40% of the time. Let's just pretend you know that to be roughly the case. Well, now you can take your pot odds, 1,000 divided by 2,850, plus the amount you're going to get in on the river, which is the rest of your opponent's stack, 2,660, 40% of the time. And now, if you do 1,000 divided by this number, that is 25%. And that's going to make this call a slightly bit profitable call because we are going to get there 26% and we only need to get there 25%. Okay? So because of the implied odds in this scenario, it becomes a call. Let's say you know your opponent's going to always go all in on the river. Well, then this number would become 1 times 2,660, which would make this a very profitable call. Right? If you're, if you're wrong about your assessment and your opponent never goes all in when the backdoor flush comes in, well, then you're not going to get this full 40% or maybe any of it, right? So whenever you get there, you may not get paid, which would make the call very unprofitable. So it's very important that you do your best to actually determine your implied odds because they will sway your decision one way or the other. That said, in the real world, poker is not all that simple. Poker's kind of difficult. Hate to break it to you, poker's a difficult game. Let's go back to our 7-6 example. Let's say we do call this 30 bet, which is an unprofitable call on the turn, or unprofitable call on the flop immediately. On the turn, um, it may check through. Your opponent may not put any more money in the pot. And let's say it does go check-check on the turn. If you bluff on the river when you miss, 
Maybe you win the pot a lot. Or maybe you lose the pot a lot. It's tough to know. Maybe your opponent's always going to check behind on the turn if they don't have anything, and they're just going to fold to any river bets. Well, in that scenario, you're going to be able to steal this pot with a river bet a large amount of the time, and you're going to get to see the river a large amount of the time. You may also hit a seven or a six on the turn and not be able to fold, and maybe you win with it or maybe you lose with it, depending on how your opponent plays. Maybe uh, you you check raise when you get there and you get called and you stack your opponent for 15x very frequently because maybe they only play really good hands and when they bet the turn, they always have a hand they're never folding. Say on the turn, you check when you make a straight, they bet 100, you make it all in and they just call it off because you know when they bet the turn every time, they always call off against an all in. In that scenario, your implied odds are maximum, right? Also, you may improve to a premium hand, but still lose. Not so much on this exact board, but say there are two hearts on the board and the turn is a nine of hearts or a four of hearts and you make a straight, but you could lose to a flush. You need to keep that in mind as well. It's very important to realize that draws to hands that are not the nuts and also hands that often make strong but second best hands may have reverse implied odds and reverse implied odds are dangerous. These are hands that very commonly have reverse implied odds. Before the flop, offsuit marginal high card hands like ace eight, ace four, ace six, king nine, king seven. These hands are trouble because they make a hand that's pretty good whenever they do make it, which is top pair. But if a lot of money goes in the pot and you're sitting there with ace eight on the ace king seven board and your opponent wants to play a big pot, they probably have your ace eight beat. Also, straight draws to the low end, like king four on seven, six, five are also trouble because sometimes when you improve to an eight, your opponent could easily be sitting there with a nine and have you crushed, right? And also if they don't have a straight, they're gonna look at this scenario and realize a hand like pocket aces on seven, six, five, not eight, or seven, six, five, three is not that good and they're not gonna pay you off. Also, weak flush draws may have reverse implied odds too, especially as the pot is very multi-way or stacks are very, very deep. Because if your opponent is willing to play a huge pot, on 10 of hearts, eight of spades, two of spades, three of spades, what do you think they really have? They probably have a good flush, right? So be careful in those scenarios too. And this is gonna be especially the case in a multi-way pot against many, many players because as more and more players see the flop, someone's likely to have something pretty good or excellent. And if it's not you, it could easily be someone else. And when people in multi-way pots want to put a lot of chips in, they realize everybody could have something. So when they realize everybody could have something, but they still like their hand, well, they probably have your good but non-nut hands beat. So definitely be careful with these hands that have big reverse implied odds.